Now, John Dominic Crossan, in his very good book on Paul, says that for Paul, you cannot be a Christian without being a mystic. That is a mouthful. To me, that means, whoa, we've got to close down about 95% of our churches and seminaries and start all over because most Christians are completely illiterate about mysticism. It doesn't have to be that way. Mysticism is so natural, it's like falling off a log. And most people who I've met in my 45 years of teaching and preaching, most people are mystics, but they, they don't know it because no one's named it for them. Here is a wonderful poet, Bill Everson, from California. The ordinary person sees God in nature or sees God not at all. By extension, the God-thirsting person sees God everywhere, for nature is omnipresent. Emerson said that nature is the language of God. It is fittingly spoken, for in the beginning was the word, and in that beginning is its end, the word then is all. For nature itself holds the clue to the divine. In its myriad forms, the great plenitude of being is poured out, streaming forth a womb of potentiality, exploding into act. A kind of metaphysical combustion seems smoldering in the fabric of things, a surge of incipient energy breaking out of the bounds of its nuclear forms, disappearing into the beyond. It is this transformation the poet celebrates. We need new eyes today to see the transparency of the universe, that divinity is every place in it. It is where this energy is. It is where the birthing and the creativity is. My striker says, what does God do all day long? God lies on a maternity bed giving birth. Now, they thought he was crazy in the 14th century, but now that's today's physics. Do you know that a, a star is being born every 15 seconds? One of those big things, every 15 seconds. Now, for 200 years, science told us, science isn't always right, you know. Mechanistic science told us that the sky was dead and inert and machine parts out there, which really ripped away the male soul and made men crazy, crazy, crazy. But now that the sky is open up, that we know the sky is a maternity bed, this opens up the soul, men and women alike, to vast reaches of hope, energy, imagination, and love. <clears throat> Here's our friend Mary Oliver, who, as you know, died a few weeks ago. I had the privilege of seeing her two years ago in a book reading uh, uh, yeah, in uh, San Francisco. She filled a, a big auditorium. She was 83 years old. At the very end, here's how she ended the day or evening. She said, um, I'm 83, so I want to tell the young people here everything I've learned about life. Everything I've learned about life. This is what I've learned. Number one, pay attention. Number two, be astonished. Number three, share your astonishment. That's it, she said. The rest is details. <laughs> but uh, Mary Oliver called herself a praise poet because she was continually responding to the astonishment of her heart, her soul, her mind interacting with nature. She and her partner lived in, on the, um, you know, the place outside Boston on the Cape Cod. Yeah. So here are a few of her uh, teachings, just a few of her, her words. Glory to the world, that great teacher. Glory to the world, that great teacher. Uh, the word glory, doxa in Greek, is a very important word when you're dealing with the cosmic Christ. It's all, in all the cosmic Christ events in the Gospels, you see this doxa, because that's about the radiance, the divinity of the divine showing through. But she applies it to the world. Glory to the world, that great teacher. There is only one question, only one question, how to love the world. That's exactly what I'm talking about. That's exactly what Ilya is talking about. That the world is two trillion galaxies. But we might as well begin at home in our neighborhood. That's a pretty big challenge right there. 
Let me keep company, she says, with those who say, look, and laugh in astonishment and bow their heads. Let me keep company with those who say, look, and laugh in astonishment and bow their heads. Bow our heads. Reverence. All that is a via positiva. Learning to be astonished again. Learning reverence again. <coughs> Pardon me. I want to be in partnership with the universe, she says. I want to be in partnership with the universe. And this new story from science is an invitation exactly to that, that we are partners with the universe. Thomas Aquinas says the greatest thing in the universe, the most excellent thing in the universe, is not the human. The most excellent thing in the universe is the universe. And this is made, he says, in the image and likeness of God. So humans can step into a fuller meaning of humility as we grow more deeply in love with the earth and everything that has brought it to this point. She says, still what I want in my life is to be willing to be dazzled, to be willing to be dazzled, to cast aside the weight of facts. So I think that's a good picture of the left brain and right brain. The left brain does a fact thing, and that's very useful. I hope my pilot, when I fly home, is real good on facts. <laughs> but there's this dazzlement to pay attention to, too. That's what the right brain gets off on. And as Einstein said, that's where values will be found. So I just love that. I want to be dazzled, I guess, aside the weight of facts. <clears throat> So, <clears throat> pardon me, um, Mary Oliver, a couple years ago, well, no, it was like 10 years ago, a woman came up to me after a lecture. She said, I just love your book on the cosmic Christ. I've read it twice. I love it so much. It changed my life. It made me a totally different Christian, and that's the only reason I've stayed in Christianity, she said. But I do have one question, she said. And I said, what's that? She said, what's a cosmic Christ? <laughs> <laughs> well... <clears throat> I like to say that every author should have one experience like that. <laughs> Just one, not two. <laughs> but I've had about 11 years to think about it. <clears throat> and now, I'll tell you, I take it as a compliment. Why? Because the cause of Christ is an experience. It's not a doctrine. It's not a piece of orthodoxy. It's an experience. You either experience the divine in things or you, you haven't yet. <clears throat> You've experienced the doxa, the glory, the radiance that pours out of things, or we're not there yet. However, as you people know, I believe deeply in the work of creativity, artists and poets and the rest, because there are only two languages for a mystical experience, only two that I know of. One is silence. Awe strikes you dumb, like Job, it happened to Job. But the other Language for mystical experience is art in all of its forms, creativity in all its forms. So here in my book on Hildegard, the chapter on Hildegard and the Cosmic Christ, I put her in the room with Mary Oliver, because Mary Oliver has a poem about the Cosmic Christ. It doesn't call it that. Here it goes. It's called At the River Clarion. <clears throat> I don't know who God is exactly, the poem begins. Oh, this is interesting. She wants to talk about who God is. And unlike most theologians, she doesn't know exactly who God is. Or those who put in God we trust on our coin, our dollar bill, <laughs> our MX missiles, and our presidential speeches. <laughs> I don't know who God is exactly, but I'll tell you this. I was sitting in the river named Clarion on a water-splashed stone, and all afternoon I listened to the voices of the river talking. Whenever the water struck the stone, it had something to say and the water itself, and even the mosses trailing under the water. And slowly, very slowly, it became clear to me what they were saying. Said the river, I am part of holiness. And I too, said the stone, and I too whispered the moss beneath the water. That, my friends, in half a page is the cosmic Christ. My book is 300 pages long. So that's this between a theologian and a poet. Now she'll talk about how this happens or doesn't happen. I've been to the river before a few times. 
Don't blame the river that nothing happened quickly. The problem is in us if we don't see the consequence. Or in our training, our ideologies, our dumb theologies, our anthropocentrism. I won't go on. <laughs> you didn't hear such voices in an hour or a day. You don't hear such voices in an hour or a day. You don't hear them at all if selfhood has stuffed your ears. <laughs> and it's difficult to hear anything anyway through all the traffic and ambition. If God exists, he isn't just churches and mathematics. He's the forest. He's the desert. He's the ice caps that are dying. He's the ghetto and the Museum of Fine Arts. He's Van Gogh and Allen Ginsberg and Robert Motherwell. He's in many desperate hands cleaning and preparing their weapons. He's every one of us, potentially. The leaf of grass, the genius, the politician, the poet. And if this is true, isn't it something very important? If this archetype of the cosmic Christ is true, isn't it something very important? One thing that amazes me about Teilhard's retelling of the cosmic Christ, and he used a phrase, I think it was in 1913, the Christ Cosmique for the first time, um, is that people think, oh, this is new age. It's so new age. Teilhard's so new age. <clears throat> The truth is, the cause of Christ is found in the oldest, the oldest writings of the Christian Bible. Paul. Paul is older than the Gospels. And the cause of Christ is there a lot. Colossians 1. Christ is the one who holds all things together in heaven and on earth. The pattern that connects, etc., etc. But it's also found in the Gospel of Thomas, which is as old as Paul and earlier than the four Gospels. It's there too. So it's just amazing that the first generation of Christians had this cosmic explosion of experience that Jesus unleashed. And they, they got it, that we're all called to be other Christs. But the church set up this system, especially when it inherited the empire, where we're just going to honor Jesus as the only Christ. It's, it's, it's distorted uh, so much. So much. <clears throat> yes, it lay dormant during the modern era. But of course, the medieval mystics, pre modern thinkers, were very at home with the cosmic Christ theology. You have it in Francis, you have it in Hildegard. Hildegard says, It's God whom people see in every creature. God whom people see in every creature. That's the cosmic Christ. She says, there is no creature that lacks an interior life. So she's answering one question that science is asking again today, and that is the question of consciousness. Do all th beings have consciousness? Do stones have consciousness? Annie Diller wrote a, wrote a book about that. Do stones talk? Her conclusion was they talk, but it takes them 10,000 years to say one word. <laughs> so you got to be patient. Or if you're really smart, like the Native Americans are, you bring them into the sweat lodge, you cook them, and do they talk in a sweat lodge? How many people have been here in a sweat lodge? You know what I'm talking about? The stones talk. They take on shapes. They call to you. And they put you through some suffering. They don't talk cheap. They put you through some duress. It's one, just one of the many things wrong with worship today in most places is it's so damn comfortable. And, uh, and you're busy, of course, reading text. What could be duller than what page are you on? Oh. <clears throat> so Rabbi Hesha says wonder is an act in which the mind confronts the universe. It's an act in which the mind confronts the universe. So everything Leah was sharing today about today's understanding of the universe, for me, is just wonder-filled. And it's just one more invitation, and a big one, not only to marry again psyche and cosmos, but to get the young excited about being here, excited about having been invited into a universe like this 
after 13.7 billion years of gestation and labor by the universe. What a privilege it is to be here. What a privilege it is to be here. And will we all wait until we're on our deathbed to recognize that? I mean, that's the option we have. We either get excited now or we'll remember it on our deathbed and say, oops, I forgot to say thanks. Whoops, I regret that I did not live fully. I regret that I did not learn the deep lessons of compassion and love that the universe is trying to teach me, that Jesus and the Buddha and Muhammad and so many others were trying to teach us. 